Okay, good evening. Welcome. Welcome to Machon Hadar. And uh, welcome to the restarting of our Tuesday night shirim and lectures, which is a really exciting time here at the yeshiva where we get to take ideas that have been germinating here and uh, on our minds and engage with, uh, with a much broader community of learners around them. Uh, we're going to begin tonight a six-part series about kashrut. And this is obviously an old question. Uh, and it's a big question, and in order to take it on, it has to be narrowed down and focused somewhat. Uh, this basic question of what Jews do and don't eat is obviously very old. It goes all the way back to the Tanakh, and we're going to begin there tonight. Uh, but it continues to be one for the present. I want to just say a word about the framing of this series and why I think it's particularly important. Uh, the framing, as you know from the title, is keeping kosher in a non-kosher world. And that means that a lot of the angles of what we're going to be considering over the course of this series are the angles of what it means to pursue a practice of kashrut in a broader society that does not necessarily reflexively adopt it, to be sure, but even support it uh, in all kinds of ways. And they, in fact, challenge it and put up challenges towards it. And thinking about uh, the practice of kashrut, as we we'll begin to define it tonight, uh, in that specific context and uh, through that lens. I would also say that we live at a time, which I think is the reason this is on my mind and on many of your minds, uh, when food is front and center in a lot of contemporary conversation and discourse. It's a time when mindful eating is coming back. It's a time where people are thinking much more about the sources of their food, what they're putting in their mouths, and therefore, a rejuvenation of the conversation, the internal Jewish conversation about what we do and don't eat uh, is particularly timely and important. I'll also say, and this goes to the in a non-kosher world uh, dimension, that, that aspect of the title, we also live in a time when in the diaspora, in the 21st century American diaspora, pretty much all boundaries that used to exist with any kind of self-evident clarity between the Jewish and non-Jewish worlds have been blurred, if not erased. And in that reality in particular, the question of what it means to be committed to a set of dietary practices becomes all the more acute. And I would say becomes, it is necessary, even more than ever before, for that to be a kind of conscious, thought out, and nuanced embrace if it's to have any kind of real ongoing vitality and serve as a source of meaning to people. Um, so, where I want to actually begin um, is with this question of why tonight. And I want to begin, actually, I wanted to bring this up before. Can I just, Shani, could you bring the board that is back there up to the front? Um, I want to begin, and if there's not, there's a marker. Great, fantastic. I want to begin with the question of why. Most of the conversation around kashrut, I think you'll see this even tonight, has mostly been a question of the mechanics of kashrut. Most of it has been about what does it mean to do this, uh, how does one do it, what are the limits and extents of one's responsibility. And that's most of the conversation. And quite frankly, that's going to be most of the conversation in this series, is focusing on those kinds of practical questions and creative ways of thinking about them. But I don't think you can begin that conversation, particularly with the social backdrop that we live in today, without having tackled on some level the question of why. What is the underlying motivating force? So I want to begin with a quick crowdsourcing of this room to just generate a number of ideas which you do not have to uh, back up or defend and they won't be attacked, but to begin to throw out some of our answers to why. Why is it that one would, should, does keep kosher? Yeah. Okay, commanded by God. Yeah. Set up boundaries. Okay, boundaries with the Gentile world. Okay, boundaries, Jew, Gentile. Okay, what else? Yeah. Uh, some kind of special spiritual diet. Okay, a spiritual diet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
moderating consumption, keeping it under control. Yeah. It can be fun. It can be fun. <laughs> you want to you wanna do a little <laughs> peyush? Okay, the, the, fun, the fun of agency and decision making. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, good, we'll, we'll come back to I think we are on to something there, actually. Yeah. Uh, it elevates our animal instinct. Okay, elevating the animal instinct by making these choices. Few more. Yeah, in the back. Cultural marker, different from the Jew Gentile boundary, or? Different. Social, cultural, Gotcha. Not keeping you away from something, but giving you a kind of positive identity through your food practice. Great. Yeah. Tradition. My parents did it, grandparents did it, even if they didn't do it, some of their grandparents did it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. So value control of the home through food, and then the benefits of community that come through uniformity of practice. Great. Maybe you can take one or two more. Yeah. Elevating a mundane, everyday act. Okay. So making sacred the mundane. Good. And one last one. Yeah. Yes, please. Reminds you you're Jewish. Okay. Great. Okay, we could add a lot more. Uh, this sort of serves my purpose of one of the points I want to make, um, which goes to the larger question here of what we're talking about when we talk about this question. Um, the first. I want us to do a quick review of what I have on the sheets in front of you in Roman numeral one, which is, what does the Torah actually say that we can and can't eat? Okay? Well, the first thing I want to impress on you is, it's quite a number of things. <laughs> and they are a range of different things. All right? And just to run through them, and they are mentioned in different places. So first we have a prohibition on blood. Then we have a prohibition on the Giva Nashe, understood rabbinically to be the sciatic nerve of animals. Chametz and machmetzet, I translated here as leaven on Pesach. The flesh of an ox stoned for killing a person. One of the things they were forbidden from eating. Trefa, flesh torn up by a predator, later becomes uh, a definition, right, rabbinically defined as anything that basically has less than a year to live is diseased in some kind of fatal way. And I know that you'll see, you can go look up all these psukim on your own, Sometimes that prohibition sounds like everyone's supposed to do it. Sometimes if you only read the verse in Vayikra, it sounds like only Koanim are responsible for that. And that's just to highlight to you that reading individual psukim in the Torah doesn't always give you the full picture of what we've inherited as the practice. Non-priests, non-Koanim, eating Basar Kodesh, sacred meat. Sacrificial bread and meat left until past its allotted time, Motar. Chalev, suet. Suet, one of those words that you only use when you are translating chayev, right? <laughs> no one ever says, can I have some suet with my potatoes? Okay, so that's another prohibition. Sacred meat that became impure. Someone impure eating sacred meat. Okay, that's a little bit of a conditional one in terms of the person and less the object. Then we've got forbidden quadrupeds. You don't have a split hair for rumination, right? The chazir, the gamar, the anevet, the shafan. Um, and everything else of that sort. Forbidden marine life, lacking fins or scales, snapiva kaskesa, forbidden flying creatures of all sorts, which relate. Technical problem with the mic. Well, I don't know how to fix it, but I'll just move it. Um, the, um, you have the forbidden flying creatures where you got a list just of names. You don't have criteria. Then you've got all the reptiles, rodents, small mammals, etc. 
then you've got Orla, first three years of produce of a fruit tree. Nivela, a carcass that dies of its own accord. Then you've got what we know today as Hadash, the first crop, the first element of the crop that comes up after Pesach, before, uh, at, in, the, in the time before Pesach, before the, uh, the Omer offering has been brought. A Nazir who takes a vow is forbidden from all grape products. A kid cooked in its mother's milk, yes, I list that as a prohibition, even though it says Lot of Asher, because in Dvarim, which is the only one I listed, it's listed in the list of forbidden foods. And then Kirayim, things that are like produce that results from planting grapes and grain too close together, it says Pentikdash Hazera, the consecration there seems to be on a level that includes prohibition of eating. Okay, and other things are derived from this, but this is basically the list. Now, why is it important to go through this list? Because of what I want to do now, which is to, to focus very carefully on getting the question right when we ask, why keep kosher? Okay, and there's four factors here that I want us to be very clear on, because I think a lot of the conversation around why do you keep kosher, why do you not keep kosher, runs aground when it avoids these questions. Okay? The first thing is to remember that any practice that has any kind of historical durability across time and space is always sustained by multiple rationales and multiple motivations. Anyone who comes along and tells you, the reason for X thing is Y, and that's the only reason, and it has nothing to do with anyone else, be suspicious. Okay? It's not that that's always wrong, but be suspicious, because really, if there was only one answer, then I would expect that that practice would have fallen out of use in places where that reason doesn't apply, which of course happens with any number of mitzvot. A mitzvot that we determine to only make sense in the context of the Veda Mikdash, of the temple, and when the temple falls, they disappear. But things that stick around and that have meaning for Jewish community across time and place, they're always sustained by multiple reasons. The second issue we have to be very careful about is what we mean when we say kosher. And to even talk about what it means to keep kosher, I think is actually kind of meaningless in light of the list that we just went through. It does not make any sense to say, or I do not find it plausible to say, that the exact same reasons why we're forbidden from eating blood apply to the exact, the, the completely different case of why we can't eat a nivella or why you can't eat a kid cooked in its mother's milk. Right? We have very different kinds of prohibitions here in the Torah. They're not all treated as one bundled up thing. And often our inability to ask the question properly of what is it that we're asking when we say what do we, why do we keep kosher or why should we also confuses us. There is a question of the context in which it's being asked. I feel like all the time when I encounter questions or struggles around kashrut, there's at least a kind of first 15 to 20 minutes of the conversation that's trying to get to the bottom line of what's actually being asked, which is to say, is a person saying, why can't I eat pig? Or is a person saying, why, when I go to my non-Jewish friend's house and he's willing to prepare everything for me in a special pot and uh, have perfectly kosher ingredients, should I still be concerned about eating there? Or why do I have to worry about eating off dishes in a restaurant when I eat everything that's only ingredients that are acceptable by the Torah? Right? Those three questions are three completely different questions, all of which can spark in a questioner, why should I keep kosher? Or some feeling of a lack of mission or direction or clarity of purpose, but you actually can't get to the bottom of it without identifying it. And the fourth, which is the most important, which I don't mean to resolve, because I don't think it can be resolved, but I think it's important to acknowledge is, what's the audience that's asking why? The audience of one, the audience of 40, the audience of 10,000. There are many different audiences that ask questions of why, just to go through a couple of them. Sometimes people ask why, and what they mean is, why is it not crazy to do such and such a thing as viewed by an outsider? Meaning, why, how could I explain to my co-workers at a cocktail party why I do X? I'm not thinking of dropping the practice or changing anything. I just want to know, can you give me some way of making sense of Hoshana Rabbah to the average person that I meet, right? That's one kind of why, okay? A different kind of why, very different, is 
I'm doing something and I'm looking for motivation and I'm looking for spiritual guidance and a way to become more enthusiastic about something. Uh, and again, my own practice is not on the line, but my passion for it, maybe the, to, the degree to which I'll sacrifice for it uh, may be on the line, and that's a very different kind of answer. Another kind of answer is, another kind of question is, I've done something my whole life, but I am thinking about abandoning it now. Why shouldn't I? Right? It's more of a why shouldn't I as opposed to why should I uh, in the negative. And then finally, someone who comes, genuinely seeking and says, gosh, I've eaten cheeseburgers my whole life. I've now encountered a practice of not doing that. And I'm really interested to find out why, why should I keep kosher? Right? Why should I perhaps adopt this practice? And the answers given to those different whys are going to be very, very different answers as they should be. Which is just a way of saying that the intellectual engagement with a question is never completely separable from the emotional stance of the questioner. You simply cannot divide those two. And so therefore, someone who just wants the reasonable explanation of Hoshana Rabbah or not eating pig or any of those things is going to often suffice with what we generally call an apologetic answer. Something that gives some kind of way of making sense of it, but that might not stand up on further scrutiny. Someone who's looking for greater inspiration to think of their diet as having greater spirituality may suffice with an answer that would only ever be intelligible to an insider, but that would never have any persuasive power to someone who wasn't already doing this. Someone who is asking, why shouldn't I abandon this, may get an answer that is loaded up with a lot more fear and scare tactics, and you will be thrown out of the community, and if you do this, you'll never be allowed home, in a way that's appropriate to someone who's saying, I'm daring you to mark out my boundary and see if I'm going to cross it. And then, of course, someone who's coming just seeking meaning and purpose and direction, they may be open to a different kind of answer that fills a void in their own life that someone who is more cynical and hardened and less searching may not be open to. All right? So it's just by way of reminding us, whenever we have these conversations, whether in this room or beyond, think about those questions whenever you're asking why or why not in terms of breaking down what it is we're doing. All right, so with that kind of lengthy introduction, okay, um, I want to begin to go into some of what some people have said about why we do this, okay? So to begin on the bottom of page one, our first people will be the Torah. And the Torah says in a number of places, um, one thing pretty much in the context of this, which is something about Kedusha and Havdalah, something about being sacred and separate. So in Vayikra Yud Aref, on the bottom of one, I didn't translate these because I just want you to see the bolded terms. In Vayikra Yud Aref, after the end of all the lists of the forbidden animals there, you have the statement, Ki ani Adonai Lechem, Vihit Kadishtem, Vihitem Kedoshim, Ki Kadosh Ani, this is our somehow sacralizing the mundane and other of these elements that have come up. It's a term that in some ways conceals more than it reveals. It tells us that there's something about sanctity going on here, um, but it doesn't totally unpack what that sanctity is. How does this make one sacred? Um, and of course, is this only about this list that we have in Vayikra Yud Aleph? Um, but Vayikra Kaf also talks about distinguishing from the nations in the land where I'm taking you into. And this is in the context of a list that has nothing to do with food, but that has to do with sexual prohibitions. But then, after it says, I've told you to do this because I shall have dealt you amin, because I've separated you from the nations, we then get thrown in almost out of nowhere I've asked you to be separate from the nations, and almost as a corollary of that, or in order to do that, or similarly, you must make distinctions between the animals that are pure and the animals that are impure, the birds that are pure, the birds that are impure, and don't make your souls, your very beings, uh, disgusting and abominable 
with the behemah and the earth and all of the other forbidden animals, which asher hivdalti lachem letamei, which I've separated out for, to you to be tamei, to be impure, and then be temei kedoshim again, and be sacred and be holy. Okay? Torah doesn't give us a whole lot more than that. It does talk about the life force being in the blood and that being a problem to consume, that it doesn't sort of totally spell out what that is. And there's a number of other places where you can draw out some meaning. Okay? But for the most part, there's some degree of implicit theory here, more than there is explicit theory, as to what these eating practices are about. So what I want to do for the rest of our time now is look at a number of rabbinic sources, which I want us just to hear and think about and reflect how they fit into this uh, framework. What is Chazal? How do classic rabbinic sources think about some of the uh, eating restrictions? And then to go through a number of uh, both ancient, medieval, and modern theories about some of the various components here. All the while keeping in mind that the idea here is to be sensitive to the ways in which various rationales may support, in part, some of the food restrictions. Right? and not to try to be tempted to find in one source a single explanation of everything that Jews do and don't eat. Okay? So, let's begin, and I'm going to ask you now to jump in with helping with the reading in whatever language you're comfortable in, uh, to see some of the sources that talk about how we think about this. Okay? So the Sifra in Acharemot on page 2. Can I have a volunteer to read? No prior experience needed. Yeshiva students, welcome to volunteer as well. Go ahead, Javi. Uh, Etc. Etc. Talmud Loma on the last line. Ani Hashem Chakakti Ein Atarashay LaHashiv Alehem. All right. So the Sifra here divides the world into Mishpatim and Chukim, mitzvot that would be logically generated and mitzvot that would not be logically generated, and it says Achilat Chazir eating pig is among those that you would not logically generate. All right, how do you understand what this Sifra, what's the point of this Sifra? How does this Sifra think about the mitzvah not to eat pig? Is there a reason here? If so, what's the reason? Yeah? We've lost the reason. So maybe there is a reason, but the Sifra is saying we don't have a reason anymore, and that's why what I've translated, I translated Yetzirah here as id, which I think is the correct translation in this context. That's why you sort of, you want to violate it. Um, and others, outsiders, taunt you that it doesn't make any sense. OK, so it has no reason it's been lost. Yeah, other readings here? OK, commanded by God. The last line here right, seems to say maybe that the point of this is uh, that you follow the divine command. Okay, we're going to see it playing out of this. It's not yet clear that this means that that depends on it being senseless. Right? The Sifra, I think, is a little more open. But some notion of following God, and despite there being doubts as to the uh, kind of self-evident nature of a mitzvah, you follow it, is a key element of this. And that maybe achilat chazir, among other things, is one of those things. Okay, yeah. Aha, uh -huh. but what would be the ethical issue here? Uh, Aha, uh -huh. so in a way it's the bounding consumption idea almost, and it played out in a different way, but it's the, it's the very fighting off of an urge that you have. There's something heroic and ethical about that, to develop that aspect of character. Okay, good. So that's another way, just to sort of play that out. This is good because I think this plays out how I want us not to overread the Sifra. But there's a way of reading the Sifra which sees this text as saying, no, the point of the ban on eating pig is that actually it has no meaning, 
It has no purpose, and the point is, nonetheless, you follow it because God said, right? Obviously, it's a little bit different, which is essentially to say, no, it's not that the point is you're following a senseless mitzvah. The idea here is, this is not something you would necessarily generate as a universal norm, but nonetheless, the Torah gave you some things that you can sort of sharpen your abilities of self-control and discipline, and that's what's important about them. But the emphasis isn't on it not having its own meaning, but just that's not sort of the, the heroic aspect of keeping this mitzvah. All right, good. Keep that sifra in mind. It's, uh, it's one of the building blocks of thinking about this. Another sifra. Someone take the next one here. Yeah. So, so the person naturally cultivate an aversion to prohibitions in the Torah? Or should a person say, I would love to eat pig, but what can I do? It's a mitzvah that I am forbidden from violating. This definitely breaks down by personality. I asked my two children this question. They're now uh, eight and six, but I asked them like two years ago. You know, do you think that basically pig is disgusting and therefore you're very glad the Torah forbade it? Or do you think, oh my God, I really wish I could eat that, but you know, what can I do, et cetera, et cetera. And my daughter said the first, and my son said the second. And it was, you know, in fitting with, in keeping with different personalities of, I think there are some people who fundamentally gravitate to wanting rules and wanting boundaries, and it's very meaningful for them to have those boundaries. And then there's others who are much more expansive in their desire to taste and experience everything in the world and are willing to put that under some kind of self-control sometimes for a divine mandate, but don't in any way cultivate a kind of ascetic personality coming out of these rules. So the Sifra is in a way meeting the person who has that kind of expansive desire for everything in the world and saying, don't deny that. Right? Embrace that part of yourself that wants to experience everything, but nonetheless, clamp down on it with subservience to God, okay? So there's, there's clearly in that text some kind of strand of the commanded by God and the boundaries on consumption and ways of taming that as another angle here, all right? We won't do all of these texts, but I want you just to see a couple other pieces here that'll take you in a slightly different direction. Um, look at the next on page three. A okay, famous text from Breshid Rabbah. Someone read this. Let's read this one in the English, the second, uh, the first text, first full text. Volunteer for this. Rab said, the mitzvah were given only to refined humans. For what difference does it make to the Holy One, blessed be he, whether an animal is slaughtered from front or the back of the neck? Therefore, we see that the mitzvah were given only to refined humans. All right, can you give me kind of a, a narrow and a broad reading of this text? And get, let's hear the broad reading of this text, the expansive claim that you could read this text as making about mitzvot and their purpose. Yeah. They're not for God, they're for you. And therefore, on some, what does it mean they're not for God? Um, meaning the, the technical details about how it's done, God doesn't potentially care about it, rather that you do it uh, for God. Okay, so the, the broad reading here is that essentially all mitzvot are a spiritual discipline that is essentially completely arbitrary. Right? At the end of the day, who really matters? I mean, this is a version of this, right? People say, you think God really cares if I eat such and such or if I do such and such? I mean, you want to tell me God is like my, you know, my friend who sits next to me at the table, fine. But if God is the transcendent master creator of the entire universe, could God possibly care? And this Midrash essentially hits this straight on. And the broad reading is a response of, yeah, you're right. God actually doesn't care. God just cares that you do it because God cares that human beings have a spiritual discipline and have a relationship with God that's worked out through that. But God doesn't really care about the details. That's the broad reading. Yeah. Um, this also could imply, although not necessarily, that there's nothing objectively wrong with anything 
Correct. I agree. I think that's the natural extension of that view is that on some level, for instance, you would say, unless you had some specific record of a given mitzvah applying to the Gentile world, for instance, you would never assume that something that's incumbent on Jews has some kind of universalizable value. Right? At the end of the day, this is some kind of spiritual discipline. Everyone's been assigned that. It's their task to follow it. End of story. All right. What's uh, anyone want to offer a narrow reading? Because the Rambam, among others, hears what I just said and turns over in his grave. Okay? The idea that you would actually say that all of Jewish religion and practice and mitzvot is based on complete arbitrary divine commands is anathema. And there's no way Rav could have said that. And there's no way if he said it, it would have been canonized in Bereshit Rabbah, et cetera, et cetera. So anyone want to offer a kind of more narrow reading? Yeah. Okay. All right, good. So one way of deflecting it is to say this is a text that is actually not about the mitzvot, but is about God's transcendence. It's about God not really being out of this world. Lo machshavotai, machshavotaychem. But for you, right, it still matters. God might not care how the George Washington Bridge is engineered. But you're damn straight that everyone who drives over it cares that it's been properly engineered, right? That kind of distinction between what God cares and not. OK, good. That's one way. How about any, any other angles where we, we don't turn that, uh, that corner? Yeah. But is there an ethical or moral value in slaughtering from the front or the back? Apparently not. So what's the value? I agree with you, but I'm, I'm pushing you. What's the, what might be the value then? Well, we either don't know the value and we have to explore it by doing it and sort of discovering the truth behind the response. Okay, so that's, that's one way, maybe by experience. Yeah? Okay, it's not exempting us from that investigation. It's just saying that God doesn't care specifically what the answer, but that we have to somehow go through that process of, of figuring out ourselves. Yeah? Could it be that <coughs> if, if sort of, I could imagine a universe in which slaughtering an animal from the back of the neck was less cruel than slaughtering an animal from the front of the neck? And that's what it means it doesn't matter to God, because God could have created the world that way. But in the world that we live in, it's clear that it's more cruel to slaughter an animal from the back of the neck. And so it's just slaughter an animal from the front. OK, let's take that basic line of reasoning. You could even take it further. Um, I agree with you. This is sort of the most intensive way to narrow it down. And this is basically what the Rambam does to this very text in the Guide for the Perplexed, um, which is to say, this specific detail that is talked about in this text is a minor detail of no consequence, which is to say, Slaughtering an animal, as opposed to just tearing it apart, taking a knife to its neck and doing a swift kill, that is, of course, of great importance. Mitzvot here doesn't really just mean mitzvot. It means the pickery details of how we happen to play it out. So you might even say, in this very world, maybe it wouldn't be a big deal if the animal was killed from behind or in front. What we care about is that animals are slaughtered. The Jewish way of doing it is to do it from the front as opposed to from the back. And it's in a basic ballpark of doing what needs to be done. And therefore, that is the kind of thing we put in the category of not, God not caring about. Now, I believe this a little bit, just these two possibilities of interpretation, because this is the classic kind of thing that goes on with any text in Chazal that weighs in on whether there is or is not a reason for mitzvot, is you're going to see the Ta'amea mitzvot crowd that's very excited about finding all kinds of reasons, like the Rambam, is going to find ways to take a text like this and cabinet it up into a tiny little space where it's essentially saying, 
right? Does it really matter that the teaspoon goes outside the soup spoon and that the teaspoon faces to the left on the top of the plate as opposed to the right? Does that really matter, right? And therefore, that's the only question on the table. But of course, that a table has forks, knives, and spoons does matter. As opposed to others who are going to read both this text and the Sifra as being all about, it's all about divine obedience, right? And actually stay away from any notion of there being investigation here. Now, this is typical, I would say to you, what we've seen so far. We'll look at one more text here. Um, but what's typical is that Chazal, for the most part, I mean, this is the thing that's, that's important to remember. Classical rabbinic sources don't engage a huge amount with ta'amea mitzvot. They don't engage that much with, here's the reason why you do something. They do here and there, but for the most part, their engagement is with how you do it, or one of the whys that I mentioned, a kind of motivational stance for continuing to do something. But the kind of sell job that often we're in this game for in the contemporary world, of how would you sell someone on why they should do this or why they shouldn't abandon this, for the most part, Chazal are not key players in that conversation. And this text and the ways in which you can stretch it in both directions is a good example of that. Let me see one more of these texts, and then we'll go into a series of rationales, OK? Then we go out of 22, OK? This, I just think, is a fascinating text for, I mean, it's fascinating in general. Um, but for thinking about what do Chazal, yes or no, think about these specific prohibitions? So someone want to read this. Hashem Matiyah Surim, God frees the bound. God frees the bound. That which I forbade to you, I permitted to you. I forbade the suet of domesticated animals, and I, for, and I permitted the suet of wild animals. I forbade the sciatic nerve, even of wild animals, but permitted it in birds. I required slaughter even of birds, but dispensed with it to fish. I forbade swine fat, but permitted the tongue of a fish. I forbade suet, but permitted other fat. I forbade meat and milk, but permitted the other. All right, so what's the upshot of this text? What do you, what do you take from this? What are the, what's the point of it, and how does it illuminate our, our quest to understand what these food restrictions are about? Well, what it's not about, apparently. It's not about what? The reason you shouldn't eat pig is apparently what? Not because the experience is problematic. Right? This entire text is about saying all of these food restrictions are not actually supposed to deny you any experience. Okay, and the rest of the text, I only excerpted in translation the pieces that have to do with food. But the rest of the text is actually like a shocking catalog of all sorts of other things. It says, you really... Uh, wanted, you really want to sleep with your brother's wife? That's forbidden. But after he dies, I created leverage marriage so that you could experience it. Okay? You really want to experience, uh, you really want to experience Eshet Ish sleeping with a married woman. It's text all addressed to men, right? You really want to experience that? That's forbidden to you. But you're allowed to take a woman as captive of war. And even though she's married to you know, the man that you, just, uh, that you just captured, you are allowed to be intimate with her. Right? I mean, it is a text that goes through in all of these cases the most unimaginable things where you would think it's about the experience. right? It's about violating the social order. It's about all the, and saying, no, actually, that's not what it's about. It's about something else. Now, what is it about? I don't know. What do you think it is about? Eating pig is not about not experiencing the taste of pig, right? Bacos is supposed to be fine, right? Like, not actual bacos, but OK. Right? Like the idea of like having, having food that tastes like the forbidden food, that's why Yikarab is very excited about that. And the previous text, which we skipped, talks about how if you follow the discipline of keeping all these rules in this world, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will make a banquet in the next world full of trait food. <laughs> right? It will be a full banquet of trait food. You'll get to eat everything you didn't get to eat. Right? Now, you would never say that about something that you found to be morally repugnant and repulsive. Right? 
you would never really say, I don't know, I don't know what to do with the marriage cases because those make that more complicated, but the banquet text, right? You would never say sort of in the future you'll be able to murder all you want, right? You would never say that. It makes us uncomfortable even to hear that. And so when you see forbidden foods treated in this way, you see some strand here that in no way is engaging with this being on some essential level. It goes back to Josh's point of, you know, is there something that's generalizably problematic here? I would say pretty clearly from this text, no. But so what do you think it is about for a text like this? Yeah. Great. So I think that fits very well with the opening line of this, right? Hashem matir asurim, which of course is an amazing play. I mean, what it literally means is freeing people who are in captive, right? Who are, who are imprisoned. Um, but it's people who are imprisoned by mitzvot will be freed from the ways in which mitzvot curb their desire and their pleasure in the future. But I think you're correct that therefore the value in the present on some level is to be bound. The value in the present is to have restrictions. Maybe because it's fun, I don't know. But also because perhaps the experience of it being bounded is, uh, is, is an issue. So I agree that, that that seems to be at the core of this text. Anything, anything else on either this text or the last, ones that we've, the last set we've seen here in Chazal? Yeah. Um, I thought that one of the things that was going on here is that it's supposed to sort of shift your base assumptions. If your base assumption is that everything should be permitted, you have a whole world of prohibitions. But if, once you list all the prohibitions and you show how there are circumstances in which they're permitted, that shifts your mind to thinking about how everything that really should be forbidden actually in some cases is permitted. And it makes you realize that, like, this is God's world. He doesn't have to let you eat anything. But he's only restricting the small thing, which he even lets you do sometimes, shows that <coughs> actually your perspective is skewed. You're only seeing what you're not allowed to do when really it's, there's so much more you are allowed to do. And so would you extend that by saying that the whole point of being restricted from some things is to then appreciate how many things are inbounds? Is it actually ad kadei kach, but that's supposed to be one of the psychological effects? I mean, I think this text is about God making the rules. I think you should feel sort of privileged for what you're permitted to do. But you're, um, it's essentially about humility towards the uh, towards the your assumption that everything should be yours is actually backwards. Uh -huh. So I don't, I don't know how that plays into the other components. Interesting. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. See, I ripped off this translation from somewhere else, and therefore it's imprecise. <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, yeah. So tell me, play it out, play it out. You're absolutely right. It's focused on the uh, on the actor, not on the result. So how? Yeah, and therefore what? <laughs> So even though in this case it's claiming, it doesn't really matter whether you are a person who does it this way or that way on the substance, but it matters as a way of the Tzaref Banat you want to read that as emphasizing that my, my experience of this being a different kind of act than I might otherwise do, and perhaps that I might otherwise do when influenced by the broader culture, that's the, that indicates that that's the locus point for that text. Okay, that's interesting. All right, good. Yeah, last comment on this section. A text like this makes me think the whole thing's a really big risk. Because I thought I was getting it. It's about not cutting nerves or eating fat. And whatever it is that I use to explain it or how you slaughter, um, it says, no, that's not it. <coughs> and it reminds me a bit of my experience as a teacher. My students are all kind of frustrated because they don't understand why they can talk at this time and can't talk at another time. And they actually just don't get it, I guess, even though it seems perfectly clear to me. Simple rules don't seem to then have any coherence. And it puts 
specifically towards the way in which I'm trying to see something higher about thinking and about respecting each other. And they're like, well, wait, you just said I couldn't talk, and now you're going to talk to my neighbor. And it's like, this feels like divine pedagogy in sort of the puzzling nature of it. Right. Well, and that also connects to Dina's comment of is there's something beyond just providing some kind of answer, giving some kind of attitudinal framing here of the kinds of questions you should be asking, what you should be taking for granted, not taking for granted, aspiring to, etc. Great. Okay. So that, that was just sort of a, a peek into what I think can be accurately described as the cryptic world of Chazal on this. Um, and why on some level we're doing one week on why and not five weeks on why, um, which is that there are some texts here, I think, that indicate what it's not about, um, but not necessarily so many that clearly uh, articulate what this is about. And that's with the caveat of the it being uh, multivalent and all of these texts having uh, very different authors in different times and places. Let's see a few people who did go out on a limb to try to articulate what this is about and let's try to think about how successful it is or isn't for which parts of the details here. All right? Um, so I'm bringing you now eight reasons. Eight reasons that have to do with dietary practices that I turned up um, and some of the, the back and forth around them. Okay? So someone give us the Rambam, the God of the Perplexed, one of the classic articulations of what's going on here. All right. I say then that to eat any of the various kinds of food that the, <coughs> that the law has forbidden us is blameworthy. Among all those forbidden to us, only pork and fat may be imagined not to be harmful. But this is not so, for pork is more humid than is proper and contains much superfluous matter. The major reason why the law abhors it is its being very dirty and feeding on dirty things. Now, if swine were used for food, marketplaces and even houses would have been dirtier than latrines, as, as may be seen at present in the country of the French. Okay. <laughs> Even the Rambam hated the French, all right? Um, so this is straight up. Right? And what's interesting about this is he's saying pigs, you would think, are, are not unhealthy. Why? Because everybody eats them, okay? Um, everybody in Christian countries is eating them and seems to be fine and there's nothing wrong with them uh, in terms of their health. But even that, the Rambam says, is like mice and all the other things that we more instinctively might say, oh yeah, those things are gross and horrible to eat. Um, and the Rambam, this I give you just this as one example, but in a number of other places, is very clear signing on to the idea that this is about health and hygiene. Now, in terms of just going back to kind of the taxonomy of the why questions and the audiences, uh, this I think is a good example of, depending on what your audience and, and context is, this will have a very different level of effectiveness as a question. Um, someone who is trying to figure out whether they should adopt this practice, having grown up their entire life eating pigs, mice, etc., is not going to be compelled by this. Right? They clearly feel that their life is fine, they're healthy enough, et cetera, et cetera. I would say similarly, someone who is thinking about apostatizing to drop this practice and to go into a general culture that eats these foods and where people seem to be fine is also not going to be, com be compelled by this. However, someone who has a stable practice around kashrut but is looking for a way to feel really good and proud about it, this is potentially a very good answer. And I think it's for that reason that it's no surprise that the Rambam is very proud to articulate this in his context. But if you look at most of the 20th century mitzvah explanation literature, okay, that is dealing with basically Jews in modern Western countries either already having dropped this practice or thinking about dropping it, most of the authors go on the war path against the hygiene explanation. And it's going to be an unacceptable, unconvincing answer. Yeah? The only thing I would turn is, you know, anecdotal evidence to kind of contradict that is two interesting phenomena. One is that after Mad Cow, I knew a lot of people <coughs> who all of a sudden, Jews and non Jews, decided that they were going to only eat kosher meat. Now, whether or not that was rational, unclear. Um, and, and second, is I just recently saw the movie Contagion, and I don't know if anyone saw it, but right, 70 million people die because a pig gets a, you know, 
a virus from a bat or something and it mutates. And I'll tell you, after the movie, I said, oh, I'm really glad I don't mutate. <laughs> <laughs> it's completely irrational as well. But right. I, I would say that I think the hygiene element or the hygiene of rationale has actually much more traction than maybe you are giving it credit for. OK, it could be. And I brought you for this reason. If you listen very carefully, you may hear the five-second clip of what follows. OK. <laughs> you can put the microphone next to it, but it's all right. You get the picture. For those of you who have seen Pulp Fiction, classic scene. And it obviously shows, like that scene shows, that there's still traction to the idea of the pig being a filthy animal. Um, and that having some kind, of, uh, some kind of traction in the broader culture. Again, how much it will convince someone, right? The, the real test would be how many people saw contagion and stopped eating certain things, right? Because at the end of the day, you have that practice, and so it, it buttresses. And I would say, overall, this is a reason that, you know, there's all sorts of things we say, ha ha, our way is much better, when we're very, you know, kind of confident in it already. But it's a fair point, yeah. I think that the health and the hygiene explanation isn't necessarily exactly the same. Because like you could say, the hygiene thing is like, oh well we're refined people, so you know, we don't eat, you know, that's a gross. But it's a little different from saying that like this will harm your health. At least in a twenty first century Western medical world where health and hygiene are not. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. I think for the Rambam, they went together, but you're right that they don't necessarily have to. Fair enough. Yeah. I think the, the play response to contagion could also be, oh, I'm only going to eat, you know, pig that's raised on a farm and they know it's Good. game. And it makes me think about, like, the Portlandia, the certificate of being organic macadamia nuts. And so, you know, I think another response that could not be, oh, I'm not going to eat something, but I'm going to think about where it's going. Correct. Great. And this is usually how you can detect whether something is an explanation or an apology. Because if it's actually an explanation, then the explainer will be open to other ways of meeting the criteria. If it's an apology, the second you start saying that, you say, well, I didn't mean that. I mean, I didn't actually mean anything that's healthy. And this is what actually leads directly to the second category here, which I've called spiritual effect, which is where a number of people come along and sometimes implicitly or consciously say, wait a minute, you can't give some straight up rational explanation of that sort. And in particular, a lot of later voices do this because they're afraid that people will make those choices. But on some level saying, this doesn't match the data. So uh, on the Torah, in the Rashi script text here, uh, above the passage that I cut for you here, he says, he kind of quotes the Rambam and that, and that approach to thinking about uh, the, the reason behind these mitzvot. And he says, you know, if that's what you're going to say it's about, then basically you're telling me that the Torah is the AMA handbook. And that doesn't make any sense. That's not what the Torah seems like it is. It doesn't seem like a medical guide and something where now a doctor decides such and such is OK, it's all right. And so what does he say? He says, that's not what the Torah cares about. The Torah seeks the well-being of the soul. And the Torah forbids these foods because they cause abomination and revulsion for the pure soul. They chase away the ruach ha-tahara, the ha etc., etc. et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's always a good defense against someone who wants to use some rational explanation from you know, empirical data to undermine the mitzvah. But it goes in sort of the category of whys that I talked about. This goes in giving someone a spiritual motivation, but there's no possible way that this will ever in any way impress or convince an outsider to the practice. Right? What does Abdelbanel even mean that this creates sort of spiritual depth? There's this notion, right? And this is, I was, I'm glad you brought this up, because when you say it gives a spiritual diet, well, so what, I'm going to put you on the spot, if you don't mind. Like, what did you mean when you said kashrut gives a spiritual diet? <laughs> I know it's unfair, but yeah. Um, I'm actually thinking of a number of different things. Like, one thing I was thinking of is that like, certain animals that are predators don't eat. They don't eat vegetarians or okay. Well, Great. There's some spiritual permanent element in those animals and they're channeling them maybe. Or like their soul is somehow conditioned to that when it's that you draw. There's also the whole spark. 
Okay, all of which I think fits into this category, and all of which I want to I want to underline. The strengths of any explanation like that is it almost ipso facto fits the data, right? Which is to say, it says the things that the Torah forbids, it does so in order to make you holy and more spiritual, etc. Whereas the Rambam does not really fit the data. Okay, the notion that everything that the Torah forbids is on some level unhealthy or necessarily unclean. Um, does not necessarily add up. Right? I mean, the camel, for instance, doesn't necessarily really fit the Rambam's criterion. And that's what's going to draw people to these spiritual articulations. The other thing that's, that's strong is, you know, you talk about the sparks, and you talk about Luriana Kabbalah, and other strands that are sort of internal to the tradition, part of the spiritual vocabulary. There's a way in which you can have different elements of the tradition stack up with one another to create something very powerful. The weakness is going to be someone who says, what do you mean sparks? Right? Until you explain to them sparks and then and klipot and da 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 and they buy into that and that becomes a part of their vocabulary, it won't necessarily translate in any way. Okay? Which is why it's not surprising that both of these exist. Okay? But there's a whole strand that resists A in order to replace it with B. Okay? All right. That's just two. Let's go on to another one. All right? Symbolism. And this is what you just touched on, Alana. Why don't you read for us the letter of Aristeus? Um, and then we'll talk very briefly about the Ramban here. For all the words that we use are tame and distinguished by their cleanliness, being on various kinds of grain and pulse. But the birds which are forbidden, you'll find to be wild and carnivorous, tyrannizing over the others by the strength which they possess, and cruelly obtain fruit by preying on the tame birds of the above. And not only so, but they see lambs and kids and injure human beings too, whether dead or alive. And so, by naming them unclean, he gave the sign by means of them that those who the legislation were ordained must practice righteousness in their hearts and not tyrannize over anyone in reliance upon their own strength or rob them of anything, but steer their course of life in accordance with justice. Okay, and the Ramban essentially says something similar in his commentary on the Torah with respect to birds. And he says something similar in the passage I gave here from Dvarim with respect to meat and milk. Why don't you do meat and milk? Because the act of doing that will in some way make you a crueler person. Okay? The idea being here, why do I call this symbolism? It's not the idea that you will karmically absorb uh, the traits of these. I don't think in Aristeus. And this is an Alexandrian Jew of the second century BC. Um, the idea here seems to be it's kind of a reminder. Every time you only eat an animal that behaves a certain way, and you refuse to eat animals that behave in another way, that becomes an effective symbol and sign of the kind of character you are supposed to have. Right, so it's not about the physiology of the way it's going to affect your body, but it's a kind of symbol. In the good Alexandrian Jewish tradition of kind of allegorizing mitzvot and thinking about what they actually represent, this is a whole other strand. Yeah, what do you think of that? Compelling, explains the data, doesn't, yeah. Why are you eating animals at all? Oh, I see. Gotcha, okay. All right, so the weak by right, good. Maybe by eating predators, we'll show them who's boss and we'll come out on top, right? Okay, so correct. With any theory like this, with any theory like this, you could potentially go, go the other way, right? To, or let's put it, I mean, let's even play what you're saying further. To take the life of a defenseless animal, you could say, could hurt your character, right? Okay. Yeah. Other, other thoughts about this category? Yeah. Well, the other problem with this is that it's sort of like, um, you, know, you could say, okay, well, I'm going to have this symbolism, but I'm going to eat the animal. You know, you could inculcate this sense without necessarily doing it. You can say, like, this speaks to me, I, I agree, but it doesn't matter. There's no karmic energy here. I don't believe it. Great. So, I mean, look, this is exactly what this is exactly what Paul did to circumcision in the wake of the Alexandrian Jewish reading of circumcision, which is to say, this is a physical sign that we do that is supposed to inculcate a certain character and a circumcision of the heart and all of those kinds of things that we're supposed to build up in terms of who we are. And basically, Paul came along and said, I have an idea. Maybe you could do that without cutting off that piece of skin. <laughs> right? um, and maybe that would enable the covenant to be broader and to include Gentiles in a, much, uh, in a much deeper way. And in a way, that was true to that allegorical 
uh, explanation. So like any allegorical explanation where it's not saying, well, actually eating this is a problem, it potentially doesn't necessarily sustain the practice when it comes up against resistance. Yeah? Great, I'll just read you from Milgram, who basically asked the same question and answers. It says, why a ritual? Could not the Bible have acted in a more ideological way, defined its concept of, we'll get to what he thinks this is about, and then left each individual free to live by it without the encumbering restrictions? The answer implied is that ideals are just abstractions, which humans may pay lip service to, yet rarely actualize. And therefore, you actually need a way to play it out on a daily basis to make it real. So that would be the counter critique. Yeah. I think, I think <coughs> symbolism as well as the uh, <coughs> argument, it's like All right, so I don't know enough about halal to comment, but again, you're doing the kind of data checking that was with any of these, uh, with any of these explanations warranted. Let's go on to a couple more, okay? That you will see from what we already articulated. Discipline. The Rambam elsewhere in his commentary to Avot, so a couple decades before writing the guide, uh, talks very clearly about what is this all about? What are the forbidden foods about? They're about getting to the Aristotelian mean it's about having not a kind of, it's about having boundedness, it's about having some kind of bounded consumption. Um, and the reason it's forbidden is so we would distance ourselves from extremes, aim towards moderation, and it's all about Kedesha Tikaba Benafshotenu Tchunat HaZehirut, which I translated as our souls acquiring a more cautious nature. All right, it's simply about having a discipline of there being things that I do or don't eat. And this again, I think, is very much an aspect of part of what we experience. I know that when I was living in Israel, for me, one of the strangest things was to be able to walk into the supermarket and to buy everything. It was bizarre. It was religiously impoverished. It was alien to me. And for the first time, I understood, not that everyone would self-admit to this being their motivation, but I understood the badatz hashgacha which is to say totally independent of the individual reason of, well, I have this opinion on true mind maser, and I hold that you can't do such and such as milking cows on Shabbat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Aside from all the individual things, Jews don't like to buy everything in the supermarket. <laughs> it's that simple. Right? Now, what we channel that into is another thing. But I think this is 100% correct that there is, in some level, it would, it would be shocking. It would be shocking if there would ever be a Jewish society that was steeped in biblical and rabbinic conversation about food practices that would create a society where there would be total agreement about buying everything in the supermarket. Because the basic thing of, you know, the hivdal ten, mina beina teya, beina Right, forget about what that subset is of what's Tamei and Tahor. The notion of I am Mavdil. On a daily basis, I am Mavdil. Um, and this is a way in which, I mean, I know this, you know, from, from the variety of experience that is out there in the Jewish world. There is a way in which people 
who only ever eat in grot kosher restaurants with their kids miss out on a certain educational experience that those who eat out and are constantly asking about the stock and the this and the that and the other thing are actually getting. Right? That's not, I'm not endorsing one way or the other. Okay, we can talk about that throughout the series as we go on with the how. But there is something there with sort of the questions, the interrogating, the havdalah actually being a part of the process. And the Ramadan, I think, is saying that in a certain way. Um, it's not just about putting a big hechsher dome over something and then behaving like a behemoth. Right? It's about actually going through the process of life of confronting things that you're not allowed to eat and not just trying to escape from that. Yeah. It's closer really to that, but it's not so much discipline as discernment, which is I think what we're getting at. But it's, and, and almost like using kashrut as a technical training ground, getting back to the earlier source about refining humanity. That <laughs> learning, you cut from the front to the back and then back to the front, or all these different rules, but they help us to be more careful. And if we're more careful with our food, then hopefully we'll be more careful in everything. Great. So I think, yes, I accept the, either it's the replacement or the addition of discernment here, I think is definitely, definitely a piece. I mean, even this term zirut and what it originally is in the Judeo-Arabic and how we best render this, there's something going on in that term that I think is capturing that, beyond sort of what I translated here as caution. There's something about making judgments that have sense for them. Yeah. Right. There are overlapping concerns there. Right. Michael Pollan, I think, is obviously his his boogeyman is less his boogeyman is the total alienation from the food chain. Right. right? And the ways in which the Yetzer Hara feeds that. Uh, and the Rambam has a different kind of Yetzer that feeds just sort of general human lawlessness, but they create an overlapping set of concerns. Yeah. Right, and what, when you ask that question, what do you assume Kadosh means? Because I could say to you that maybe that is what Kadosh means. That Kadosh means separation and some degree of creating a world in which there is sacred and mundane is itself the very act that Kadusha is about. But Uh huh. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Certainly, on, certainly the vocabulary is so. Um, but we'd have to dig down deeper to figure out exactly what it is that we mean by that. We'll get to one a bit of Milgram's piece before we finish that may give one, one theory of that. Yeah, one more comment on this. Great. So look, look, this goes back to the relationship between Havdalah and Kedushah, and on some level, kind of which is prior to which, and whether the very act of choosing and the dividing is itself, on some level, what we're getting to, and being that, that kind of thoughtful actor, which I think for the Rambam is a plausible, is a plausible read. A couple more things here. Obedience. Rashi takes the Sifra to a level I don't think it was at. The Sifra, you'll remember before we saw, said, look, there's some things you would generate on your own. Then there's some things you wouldn't necessarily generate on your own. You would come up, any society would come up with a rule not to murder. You wouldn't come up with not eating pig. 
That happens to be a distinctly Jewish thing. But as we said before, I think there's a totally plausible reading of the Sifra that's not saying, but it's, it's a senseless, meaningless thing that intends you to walk in lockstep with God despite not understanding it. But Rashi does say that. He says, Chukotai, in describing the things that Abraham kept even before any Torah was revealed. There's an exact quote of the Sifra, but with three key words added. Well, more than three key words. So the last phrase here added. There is no reason, says Rashi. No, we don't know the reason. Not that the reason isn't the ikar or the reason might not be generalizable. There is no reason. The point of this is to obey. And then, of course, when you get to that, when obedience is the most important thing, right, you can eventually produce a kind of Kantian theory of obedience where davka, the acid test of obedience, is it making no sense whatsoever. Because if it makes any sense, I always have my obedience alloyed by some sense of serving what I think is right, which at the end of the day is not obedience. All right? That's a larger conversation of kind of the history of that in Jewish thought and then its modern turn of actually inserting into that dafka things that feel unethical are the acid test of obedience, which, as some of you know, I take great objection to. Um, but Rashi, in a more minimal way, not getting to that level, is saying there actually is something about this mitzvah, among others, that is dafka about it being a sort of supra-rational uh, imperative. Yeah. Uh huh. That's nice. That's nice. Um, yeah. Um, which, of course, you know, that's what Litzrof comes from. Is, you know, Etzrof kabor sigaich, is I will take out the dross. Um, so, yeah, you want to read it. You want to read Robin Breshi Rabba is saying, Kedeitzrof ben Abriel, I dafka give you a thing which you could imagine doing either way, such that you'll have to confront you're not doing this because of a rational reason you would generate on your own say so. And thereby, you will come learn it. It's interesting, because if you really went with that reading, it would simultaneously be narrow and broad. Because for it to work, it would have to only be applied to things that really have no reason. Like maybe slaughtering from front and back, maybe achilat chazir, etc. Um, but it would still be sort of narrow in that, well, not all mitzvot are that, because some mitzvot, that will actually, there's some clear and obvious reason, maybe the Torah itself even gives it. Um, but that's interesting. That's another way of reading that text as being about obedience. Good, good. Um, all right, the final three here, just to see them quickly. Um, cultural barriers. The idea that this is to keep us away from other people. That's what it's about. Uh, the letter of Aristeus plays this out. Uh, our lawgiver being a wise man fenced us round with impregnable ramparts and walls of iron that we might not mingle at all with any of the other nations but remain pure in body and soul, free from all vain imaginations, worshiping the one almighty God above the whole creation. Okay? Or something I saw at one point on an ish.com uh, page, which said something like, it's kind of hard to get intermarried if you can't eat your future and mother-in-law's food, isn't it? Right? Okay? <laughs> All right, it was that kind of formulation, and it's the exact category of saying, this is about saying, if Jews stick to a practice that is different from everybody else, then that will keep them different from everybody else, because one of the main ways that people create fellowship is around food. And if food is off limits, it will create a major barrier. And in terms of just seeing how this has played out, if you look at Tacitus in the first and second century, what does he say about the Jews? The Jews among themselves, they are inflexibly honest and ever ready to show compassion, though they regard the rest of mankind with all the hatred of enemies. And what's the ways in which we see this? They sit apart at meals, they sleep apart, and though as a nation they are singularly prone to lust, they abstain from intercourse with foreign women. Among themselves, nothing is unlawful. <laughs> okay? 
Um, this is obviously a classic ancient anti-Semitic text, but the idea of saying they sit apart at meals as one of the things that you throw um, at people shows that there was effect um, of this having this kind of barrier effect. And we see it actually from the other side. It's reported uh, Seneca, another Roman writer, um, says that if someone says there's a, they're a vegetarian, they're probably a Jew. <laughs> now what does that mean? There's all kinds of Jews going around in the Roman Empire who are trying not to eat the things forbidden by the Torah, but trying to sit and eat with Romans and have some kind of cultural commerce. But they apparently don't just say, well, I keep kosher, so I can't eat those things. They try to blend in. No, I'm like from Northern California. I just don't eat this, that, the other thing. And you know they pass by. So we see that you, it's very clear that the evidence from the, the Roman Empire is that you've got people trying to mix, feeling this as a barrier, some trying to overcome that barrier, some not. Of course, the weakness of this explanation is the Torah in sovereign ancient Israel on their own land, etc., still cares quite a lot about food, even when you're not dealing with some kind of diaspora minority situation and talking a language of preserving your numbers against the onslaught of a majority. Okay? But it's another thing that has been out there. Finally, idolatry. That you can see that's the Rambam's famous explanation about meat with milk. And Jacob Milgram, to give him a few minutes here, um, Jacob Milgram tries to make pretty much everything in Vayikra, um, but certainly uh, the food prohibitions, about life. It's about life. The, for, for Milgram, pretty much most of the restrictions in Vayikra are about advancing a culture of life against a culture of death keeping the culture that thinks that demons and death and other things are significant and controlling at bay, and trying to create a society that is focused deeply on a culture of life. So someone read us uh, Jacob Milgram here in, uh, on page six in the middle. His three-sentence synopsis of the rationale for the dietary law. Yeah. Okay. Now, I just want to say first about the first part, because it's actually quite ingenious. Milgram does a whole kind of analysis of what are the animals that are available in ancient Israel, um, as he tries to build up this theory that what actually the restrictions are about is about just limiting the animals that are available. So first he says, look, the pig had its own reasons for being forbidden. The pig was probably involved in all kinds of idolatrous worship rites. There were other uh, communities in the ancient Near East that abominated the pig. And he basically says, the reason you have the whole category of it must chew its cud is because of the pig. Other than that, it's a split hoof category. There's this category of chewing the cud, which is invented in order to forbid the pig. But that you have uh, the animals that have split hooves is basically a way of saying, we're going to let you eat the few domestic animals that you raise and a couple of the others that could be hunted, like deer, et cetera. But you are not, for the most part, going to go out and just find animals and kill them and eat them. The ones that are already domesticated, which can basically be summed up by the split hoof, that's pretty much what you do. The list of forbidden birds basically accomplishes the same thing. Not because, right, the fact that they're predators he doesn't see as the sort of spiritual basis for it, but the fact that the predators are, they're sort of wild birds that are out there. And for the most part, you can't eat birds. The birds that you have domestically at home that you raise, you're allowed to eat those for food. The fish thing is actually the most amazing thing. He says, in the middle of his analysis of this, he says, while I was writing this, I happened into a zoological lecture in such and such a place. And it was about what happened to marine life in the Eastern Mediterranean after the opening of the Suez Canal. And Milgram says what they discovered, in fact, was that before the Suez Canal was dug, think about it. 
A fish to get to the eastern Mediterranean has to go like all the way past the Straits of Gibraltar if it's native to the ocean, right? So what you actually had at the eastern Mediterranean, and because it also is, was an incredibly silty area and it, had, it was kind of nutrient rich in the soil but hard to access for migratory fish, was essentially what it has was a lot of shellfish and other bottom crawlers, etc. A very, very few species of fish. Such that the criterion of saying it must have fins and scales is a way of saying you basically can't eat anything in the water either, except a couple things that are there. Once they dig the Suez Canal, all these fish flow in from the Red Sea and from the much closer access to the, uh, to the ocean there and then colonize that area such that now it's thought of as a place that has a lot of fish that can be caught. Um, and the fins and scales doesn't actually limit the number of species that are available. Um, so his global argument is basically this is about limiting the life forms that are available for consumption, as he says here, and that that adds up with the blood prohibition and with other components to create a situation where, as we learn, and this is a pretty strong proof text, as we learn in Breshid Aleph, the ideal is that human beings don't eat meat or at least that they rarely eat it. And the way the world is set up is that way. It's only after the flood and the corruption of humanity that a concession is made to eat meat. But in the wake of that concession, all of humanity is forbidden from eating blood. And that he makes a big deal out of, right? Noah is explicitly told when he comes out of the Teva, he may not. And then, when we get to a people that's supposed to, resent, it's supposed to somehow inculcate itself with a higher level of Kedusha, that people is going to have as one of its hallmarks being closer to Breshid Aleph. Okay? Now, he says, of course, he says, you know, the problem is, well, but what's to stop you from um, having an entire glot shop with shrink-wrapped packages of meat that you eat every night of the week, and then you're following the rules of the Torah, but basically you're eating this enormous amount. And he says, well, my honest answer to that is, in the biblical world, this wouldn't have been a problem because of the animals that could be consumed, which are basically the domesticated animals, a given farmer is not going to be able to afford to slaughter their animals right and left. And so by limiting it to those domesticated animals, you basically are going to make it a somewhat rare event. That is, you know, a zevach mishpacha, some kind of family event in that way. Um, he is expounding, he's a biblical commentator. He's not a, he's not a posaic or a social uh, policy writer. But obviously then the gap of what you do in a contemporary world where those other pieces are, where that kind of uh, broader access to meat has obviously gone sort of off the charts, that's a serious question with this as the, as the motivating force. Okay, so let me say by way of, uh, of summing us up here. We've seen eight different, uh, eight different kinds of... Uh, rationales here. I want to return to where I began, which is by way of saying that these eight and the things in here that don't quite respond to them, though there's a bunch that I think you'll see plug into what we've talked about, um, are all ultimately additive in supporting a very rich and divergent set of practices and restrictions. And what we're going to be turning to in the next six, uh, in the next five sessions is really to try to get at, with a finer tooth comb, uh, an analysis of the different aspects of breaking down these food questions and thinking in a very practical way about the issues at stake. All right? And what I want to just leave you with is there are essentially four questions that you have to ask when that Chazal want us to ask when we think about eating and that we will see, I think, different of these whys play out differently for these different factors. And this is going to be part of my general agenda to you of, we're not talking about kashrut, we're talking about different food practices, what they are aiming at, and how they play out in the world. The first is a question of ingredients. What is in the food that I am eating? And that's going to be the subject of next week's topic. We have a long list of things we can't eat. How do I determine whether the thing that's in front of me does or doesn't have those things? Who do I trust to tell me that? What's the standard for what makes it the forbidden thing in the Torah? And I avoid those things. Then, separate from that, this I would contend to you has very little to do ultimately with separating from Gentiles per se, has very little to do with any of the things that 
that don't account for the data of, again, a sovereign nation on its land in the time of the Torah caring about the things that we eat. The second thing is going to be a question of utensils and preparation. What was the stuff made in? What's the history of the pots and pans in which the things are cooked? Which is a completely different question than the ingredients. Has to do with a question of procedure, what my control is. There may be aspects of kedusha and various questions that go into that. There's then going to be another question, which is the question of who prepared it? Preparer. Um, who made the food? Even if the food is completely unobjectionable on ingredients, and even if the utensils are my own, who prepared this food? And does my commerce with that person, my fellowship around food, present risks to me that require me to be cautious before eating that food. All right? That is what I'm going to argue to you. That is the explicit and head-on engagement with the question of the ways in which food creates fellowship, and therefore there need to be some kinds of distinctions potentially made in certain contexts. And the final question is one of context and place, which is to say, are there certain things, are there certain areas, are there certain settings where it's problematic for me to be and to share fellowship over food, even if I bring my own double-wrapped airline meal and there's nothing that's possibly wrong with it in terms of what's in it. Um, these four questions are going to guide us for the next four weeks. The what, the how, the who, and the where. And then in our final week, we'll try to synthesize all the different details of what we've seen. A little bit maybe come back to the why that we began to dig into uh, this time. And also have some significant time for really just practical questions around synthesizing this into a workable practice. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you for coming.